Hey everyone, uh, thanks for joining me on this session with Shopping Smart with IoT. I'm Neerja Ganesan and I'm a software developer at Microsoft, developer slash engineer, formerly a developer advocate. So uh, today's session, let me just start by sharing the slide deck. All right, so here it goes. Uh, that's my Twitter link if you'll want to follow and hear me rant long. So uh, before we begin, here's my disclaimer for the day. All opinions are mine alone. They don't represent any of Microsoft in any shape or form. I'm speaking strictly as a developer. So uh, our agenda for the, for the day is going to be as following. So if you have retail as a scenario, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Why is IoT a solution for it? Okay, so what is the problem that you're trying to solve in the retail scenario? Why is IoT the solution for it? We'll be looking at two demos, one with cloud and the other without. And uh, last but definitely not the least, we want to take a look at all the technologies that are available that you can couple with IoT to essentially strengthen your solution. So uh, let's get started by looking at what the problem is. So a problem scenario for the day. So uh, when you have business to business or business to consumer, there are two kinds of retail mindsets that go along. One of it is traditional and the other one is more modern or IoT driven. So, and the difference between the two essentially lies in how do you create value and how do you capture that value once you've created it? And value being that for society or for business. So in a traditional one, you create value by reacting to society. That is, you're waiting for the society to speak up and tell you, here's the problem that I have. You exercise that to your advantage, create a problem, and provide it to them. And the value that you're capturing out of this whole scenario lies in the brand that you create for yourself, maybe the ownership that comes into place or the IP offering, right? But what you have in modern retail these days, or IoT-driven, is that the value you create is essentially by predicting what the society will need even before they can tell you what they need. You come up with a solution, and the value that you capitalize and how you personalize the solution. Uh, it can cater to both product and non-product related problems, non-product being more valuable in this case, like pricing or networking. You want to take a look at how you're essentially delivering the item to them, are they getting it on time? And the reason why the latter is getting traction these days it can simply be observed by how little time people have when it comes to waiting, right? So nobody has endless hours to go and wait at a grocery store for somebody to stock up. A, because you don't have time, and B, because you have a competitor who's offering all of that to you right in front of you, right? And the reason why retailers are essentially keep up trying or struggling to keep up with the supply chain demand is the rise in consumerism. You want to maintain that. And in order to stay relevant, you want to essentially share sorry, shape your business model in such a way that you're agile, you're making smart decisions, you're being predictive, and you're analyzing a lot of trends that are happening. And one part of retail comes in creating a quality product, which is all well and good. Everybody has been doing that for a long time now. In a traditional mindset, creating a good product alone was essential to have your business deliver for you. But today, when you have multiple vendors who are creating the same thing really well, what is it that's going to make you stand out, right? And that will essentially lie on how you deliver things to the customer. Are you giving things to them when they need it and where they need it? Is your price point competitive? Are you able to promote the product well enough? Are you able to physically place it in such a scenario that they can look at what's happening? And uh, I know that consumerism is largely contingent on various external factors, like you know what your economic policies are like, what your job scenarios are like, taxes, etc. But by and large, you can conclude that people are working more, which means they're earning more and they're spending more. And spending is not even necessarily a frivolous thing. It can be very timely, something as little as, oh, uh, I've hurt my hand today, so I can't chop my onions. I'm going to go buy a can of it. A, because I don't have time, and B, because I can't do it, right? So uh, all of this boils down to what is the problem that you're trying to solve? That's inventory management. How can a retailer predict a need before it arises? And uh, the solution to that is the Internet of Things. Internet of Things simply put as the art of like capturing data via sensors. You want to transfer it over the internet. After you've received it, you want to give meaning to it because your data is only as useful as the meaning that you give to it. 
And after you've given meaning to it, are you wisely analyzing it to create or alter your business solution for it? The purpose behind using IoT and technology and solutions like this is to essentially free manpower, right? You want to free them for all the jobs and experiences that cannot be duplicated. And if you can use technology to automate redundant things like inventory management, then why not? So the whole thing boils down to realizing that technology out here is just enabling you to actually realize your true profits by selling your actual and real product. And you want to look at it as an investment that's going to have a short term and long term gain and a set more than a liability. And yes, IoT is poised to transform your business landscape. Inventory management can heavily benefit from IoT simply because you're making decisions that are based on empirical proof. It's not a loose judgment call, but numerical data, which is actually a direct representation of behavior, of human behavior outside. And we all know that numbers don't lie, right? So uh, that is the whole point behind having IoT as a solution. So uh, we're going to quickly look at a couple of demos, one with cloud and the other without cloud, both of which solve the problem of how IoT is used or how inventory management can be done. So I will switch over, disable screen sharing, and uh, I'll show you. So this is what I have in front of me. The first demo that we're trying to have is to essentially simulate the blue jeans problem. Uh, I use that term simply because uh, you'll find that on the Intel page. It boils down to essentially saying that if you have a pair of jeans that are on, that's probably on the storage shelf of a store, how will an inventor, somebody who's managing it realize that it's not, it's already being sold, then how do you know when you need to go and stock up on it? So uh, we're going to simulate that using the Intel Edison. I have it connected up to a power cord out here. Um, it uses the Grove Base Shield, which I think is really good because it'll avoid the problem of how you want to put your pins. You don't run the risk of blowing up your resistors and capacitors. It's pretty cool that way. It's got about eight digital connections, four analog and four I 2 C LC LEDs. That's your light emitting diodes, the LCDs, my bad. So uh, I've connected the touch sensor to it. So that's going up in my digital card and I do have a display which is connected to I 2 C. It's running on power. So the power that this consumes is about four to seven volts at 2.5 amps. You can very easily duplicate this with a power bank or use AC supply the way you want it to. So the whole premise behind this is, if you have a product that touches the touch sensor, you want the LED to basically glow green and say that you're all good, you don't need to stack up. And if you've released it, you want to say there's no product that's touching it, which means there's no product available to sell. So you want to say that it's going to, you wanted to say that you need to stop. So um, again, I will switch my screen and show you how I'm running this. So I have my terminal that I'm running here. So I've SSH'd into my root. I'm in, the, I'm in the folder, so I'm going to CD into that and essentially going to run it slash detect.js, right? So when I have that enabled, you see that the Intel Edison, Intel Edison connection has started. It's initialized, so I will switch back the screen again. All right. So here it is. So this is the Edison that's running, and I do have a touch sensor. And when I touch it right now, the sensor, you essentially have the display glowing green, which says IL4 is good. You release it, it says IL4 need to stock up, right? So imagine that you have a touch sensor that is right underneath. This is a really bad representation. But if this were the storage container or the shelf, if it were not touching out here, it's essentially supposed to say the aisle needs to be stuck up. And if I do have something that goes on top of it and it is touching that, if I were to engineer it well, it would go green and say that is good to go. So that was how I simulated it. And um, quickly enabling screen sharing, what I'm doing here is. So this is how it was built. So the technology that we used is the IntelliSense microcontroller. The sensors that we used are the touch sensor and the LCD, the liquid crystal display. 
And the coding language I used out here is Node.js. So this is something that I'm not running on cloud yet. Uh, what I could do is a use an instance of Node.red on the Edison. I could actually power this whole up, whole thing up even without cloud. Let's say only for where, for a connected home thing, right? Even if you don't want cloud, if you want something that's only within your geographic location, and uh, this whole thing can be augmented. And this is a step again. Step one: the Edison subscribes to data from the touch sensor. Step two, the touch sensor will send signals based on whether it's contacted or not. And in step three, you have the Edison, which receives this and in turn makes the LCD glow green or red. So we already saw that simulation. So what is the fourth step to this? You can always augment this app. A, you can use other sensors and B, you can enable communication. So you can add a lot of bells and whistles to garnish this whole solution. You could add a weight sensor to actually track how much the shelf weighs, which means if it has a lot of genes on it, you know that it's stocked up, but then as you keep pulling them out, the weight sensor will start measuring less and less, and you'll know as it's going down, right? That's one way to do it. How do you enable communication? You could use a the NPM package module, okay? That's known as node mailer. Even without using cloud, your node server is enough to start sending email alerts, which you could enable. Then you can use a buzzer, which will obviously create noise to alert you if something's done. So that is one demo. The second thing is how do you temperature control in storage rooms? Okay. So the scenario that you have out here is imagine a retailer who's trying to essentially sell goods that are perishable, right? You take meat or you take milk, all of which would come with an expiry date, a temperature range under which the whole thing needs to be stored. So if you go out of range, you run into an array of problems. One, your product goes bad. Two, you're paying for power for which you essentially are not getting any returns on your investment. Three, you need to stock up to pay more. And four, you're not meeting the supply chain demand. So the problem that you have out here is how is the retailer going to be able to tell when the temperature has gone bad? And will they be able to know of that problem when they still have the time to solve it, right? So the next solution we're going to look at is using a temperature sensor. And for this, we'll be using the Azure IoT Suite, which comes from Microsoft. So you're sending data to the club and you're analyzing it out there. So I'm using the same Intel Edison. I will disconnect the LCDs and the touch sensor, and I will add to it the temperature sensor. Temperature of analog, so I'm adding it to A to zero. Then same board. And um, I'll start by showing you how this runs, and then we'll switch screens to see how it receives data. All right, the terminal that I have, I also have a little message that says, just chill or stock up and close. So I exited the board and let me go back and CD into Azure monitoring. I'm in the right folder, yep. So I'm running the remote monitoring file. So if you look at the screen right now, what you're doing is essentially sending data to the cloud. Your Intel Edison has been initialized. This is the data that goes to the cloud. That is the device information, whether it's a simulated device. No, it's a real device. The device properties, like what the ID is, has it been enabled, the time at which it was created, there's a latitude and longitude, you note out here, a serial number, and a lot of parameters like temperature, humidity. That was the race against time. I had to say that before the screen went up. So this is the frequency at which temperature is being recorded right now. It can be recorded, let's say, about every three seconds, every one second. And you can change it, obviously, to set it like every 10 minutes or every one hour the way you want it. I'm only measuring temperature for now. And what we want to see is how is cloud receiving this. So for this, I've provisioned essentially the Azure IoT suite. So if you see it on the screen out here, uh, the green line chart that's moving is essentially the temperature that's coming from the device. This is the device to view. It's got a really good dashboard. You choose multiple devices at a time. So I've chosen only one for now. It can also measure humidity, external temperature, and partition ID, which we're not doing for now. 
the other good thing about it is you also have an alarm history. So the rule that I have set in this case is my temperature goes above 26. I wanted to raise an alarm temperature. So yesterday it went above 26, let's say at around 10 p.m. So I would try to simulate the rays by maybe touching this temperature sensor, trying to increase it. Uh, give it a second or two, you should be able to see the rise in it. All right, so there you see a spike out here, right? So it is going above 25. And yeah, there it is. So it's gone above 25, which means it's 26. So if you were to see the alarm history out here, it should ideally show you. Obviously, I'm going to refresh the page one quick second. You know what? If it hasn't, we should set up a new rule. So I will add a new rule out here to say, go to rules, go to the last set of rules out here for my Edison, and I will edit this rule and say if it goes above 25. The weather is pretty cold here. I can't make it go above 26. What I'm trying to say, if it goes above 25, you output the rule saying it's an alarm. Save and view rules as quick enough. Go back to the dashboard. Temperature is dropped down, so I will try to simulate it again. And once it goes above 25, hopefully we see a change out here. So this is a real-time graph. Uh, if you had humidity that you were transferring, you would also have a maximum and minimum. Okay, for the last time. Of course, this is not working. All right, I swear it was, because you do see the last time it happened was yesterday. Okay, if it comes back again, I'll show it to you guys. So this is essentially the Azure IoT suite. So I will pause that for a quick second right now. And the next thing we're gonna do is take a look at what the Azure IoT suite is and how you can enable it. Furthermore, a few other things can be added to this solution. You can add it to the Twilio API to send SMS alerts. You could send it to the SendGrid API to send email alerts for you. So, pause that. Close this. And oh, there it is, finally. 3rd of June today at 1.38 p.m., all of these alarms, right? So these can be coupled by adding the Twilio API for SMS of the SendGrid API for email. So I will pause that for a second. That's done, I'll switch the screen. And I'll show you guys what the Azure IoT suite is. So uh, Azure IoT is essentially a suite, a sophisticated one that's a representation of a real-time architecture, an enterprise level architecture. So it has multiple pre-provisioned solutions. One of it is remote monitoring, two others are connected factory and predictive maintenance. Right, so predictive maintenance again does a lot of analysis and uh, it predicts trends based on the amount of data it has. So, the more data you provide to it, the better it will be able to analyze. So, I have chosen remote monitoring. So, the one that I created was based off of that. So, when I created remote monitoring, what essentially happened was it provisioned about five or 10 different cloud products on my Azure portal. So if I go back to this page out here and see more, this is my Azure portal, by the way, the dashboard. And uh, this is the resource group that I use, Ninja Monitor Sensor, created by 10 different products, like Cosmos DB, then you have Storage Account, then you have the IoT Hub, then Event and Stream Analytics for handling data, service plans. Okay, before I continue further, the next question, yes. We have two questions on the screen which say, how much does this cost, the Azure IoT Hub, the last time I've tried to drain my monthly limit for this part? Okay, so the Azure IoT suite essentially is the representation of the enterprise level architecture. So there are ways for you to, there are ways for you to lower the cost, right? So if you look at the suite, it's got multiple plans that are chosen by default. Like a scaling will automatically be set to tier two or tier three, it's always, possible for you to drop it down to tier one. Then your service plan, um, the number of, based on the number of messages that go between the device to cloud and cloud to device, your storage plan is automatically set to some sort of premium, right? You can always drop it down to standard or basic. 
those are possible too. Let me show that to you on the suite. So um, if I were to go back to the suite out here, for example, let's look at the IoT Hub. If you look at shared access, pricing and scale, so the standard scale out here is S1 because I chose that, but you do have two others available, standard S2, S3, which are priced more than you have the free ones, right? So standard is like about $50 for one IoT unit where it uses 200 units and you look at the number of messages per day which get transmitted between device and cloud. Uh, same thing for S2 and S3, you do have to be wary of it. It's a scaled down version, so they'll automatically set it to something more enterprise. So you should be able to go through each of it and lower it. You do have free ones as well. That is for the IoT hub. Then if you look at the sensor job, the jobs plan, right? And then if you look at the scaling policy, that is you can scale up or scale down. It's got a lot of other policies, all of which are contingent on the amount of memory, the amount of core you have, the data, quantity like 50 gb out here your premium's got 250 gb of storage the number of slots right and how many instances you want i when i provisioned this it was chosen to premium i had to scale it down to basic b1 so i'm okay which is 1.75 gb and about it cost me about 32 dollars based on how much i use it then um what else do i have going on out here that's so much um you also do have the Cosmos DB account. Cosmos is again a database for storage. So if you scroll down out here further and look at Document Explorer, it actually has a list of all of the documents, meaning the data that's coming for now. So if you choose any one document, no SQL, you do have all of the device properties when the device was created. You scroll down, you look at all the telemetry that goes into it, all of this data, right? So the other things that you can look at it. So there are multiple ways for you to customize this based on how you want. Uh, for those of you who are interested on how to do this, uh, open a new tab. I will place the link right now, so take a look at it. This is called Getting Started with Microsoft Azure IoT Starter Kit Intel, Intel Edison. Okay, um, I'll address both of your questions in just a second. So uh, if you go through this one, uh, it doesn't have a lot of images, but if you do have your basic device set up with a firmware flashed, uh, it's very, very easy to follow. The tutorial is fairly intuitive, the screen is as well. And they obviously do address this statement out here which says visit this guide to run the solution in demo mode and reduce the Azure consumption. So that is something they've realized themselves too. So the demo guide for lowering this price is eventually this one that I followed. Okay, this is, don't you think people lose out reading all these options of the pricing more than the core tech experimentation? Okay, so I would agree with that, but I also think it's essential because IoT is something that people are today want to use it for retail or for an enterprise level architecture, right? So you want to be able to see how it would if you were to be able to use it at enterprise level. If I were to have just one instance and if I were to develop all of this for as a hobbyist at home, it's completely okay but that's not a problem I'm trying to solve. I'm trying to solve this problem, keeping in mind that it's gonna be scalable. So I'd rather see a real-time instance of how much I'm expecting to pay. So I would think you wanna divide this whole problem in such a way that you let people who are developing do the actual development. You have somebody else take a look at the pricing plan. That's probably the only way the whole thing's gonna work because if you have one person focusing on everything else and everything, then yes, you will lose out on one or the other. And, uh, does that answer the question? If not, we can chat more on this later. Uh, I would also recommend speaking to somebody who's an evangelist at Microsoft who will be able to tell you much better how to navigate around all of this. They will be able to pick up a good selling point for it. But I can tell you this, uh, I'm delivering this session entirely as a developer. I did not have a problem developing it simply because they had a good documentation that worked. All right. They had a good documentation, so that worked out for me. I focused very little time on lowering all of this, probably like five or 10 minutes once I followed that tutorial. And I was free to spend all of my time on developing. So first-hand experience, it worked for me. Uh, let me also show you how the portal looks otherwise. Uh, 
few things you can play around. Uh, if you go to the search bar on top, you click on subscriptions. Uh, these are all the subscriptions that I have in my account. You can click on that one to see how the pricing is happening, the burn down and the breakdown rate. So uh, it's going to be able to predict for you going at this particular rate when you're going to exhaust all of your credits. So I have about $150 of that credits every month. Uh, so if I were to continue using it at this rate, it still looks like I will be under my $150 consumption and will go all the way to like 30th of June, which is the end of my subscription cycle before the next one begins. Then, um, so on the dashboard, these are the other solutions that they do have. If I want to create something new, in terms of Internet of Things, they have individual solutions for IoT hubs, event hubs, time series, stream analytics. If you want to look at AI and cognitive services, you do have the computer version API, which can detect an object, the face detection API, which will be able to demarcate a face in an image, then auto suggest, which will help you complete, spell check, then uh, you have the speech service, which does the speech recognition. Then for data and analytics, you have cognitive services, you have HD Insights, which is based on big data service. These are the multiple databases that's also offered on Azure. You have SQL database, which is the row column structure. Then you have NoSQL, you saw with DocumentDB, Cosmos. Then you have Azure database for MySQL. You also have an Elastic database pool. Then MongoDB, that is cache for memory distribution. Then for web and mobile, a few of the, which I haven't explored. I haven't explored all of these, but I would definitely like to take a look at the notification hub. That's really good for push notifications. Then um, I would say that is these are the few components, few core components that Azure does offer. You do have a Red Hat Enterprise version and Ubuntu version, Windows, and you have Visual Studio Enterprise level, Azure containers, batch services, service fabrics, right? So uh, these, this is a little rundown of how your Azure dashboard looks. So the next thing that you do have, having taken care of these demos is, again, same thing you, how it works, you guys saw that, I don't want to go over it again. We already saw the Azure IT suite is. So uh, I think these are some few technologies that are going to be really useful, which can be coupled along with IoT. IoT is not necessarily standalone, right? So uh, beacons, blockchain, computer vision, and virtual reality. So, uh, what are beacons? So beacons are essentially devices which are little transmitters. They have a little ID associated with them. So if you were to be, if you were to have an app on your phone, which is in the range of a beacon, it will be able to send you a push notification based on that ID, and that push notification will have a lot of information. So imagine uh, a scenario where you walk to a store, you're at the aisle that sells a lot of baking goods, right? So if the beacon that is set out there can identify that you're in the baking goods aisle, it should be able to send you a push notification at that particular location telling you that we do have a promotion going on sugar or you do have a promotion going on icing, right? So the problem you're trying to solve out here is essentially promoting the object to a customer when he or she is in a physical vicinity of the object instead of doing it ahead of time. Uh, the problem with doing it ahead of time is, one, you run the risk of the promotion expiring before the person or the consumer actually gets to the store. And two, they don't even remember that it existed, right? Because people are not really into remembering things that they don't need to remember. So uh, this solves the problem of business to consumers. That's what a beacon does. Again, very IoT related. The second thing that we have is... Uh, very new and uh, it's been going around really well, blockchain. So blockchain is essentially a record or a ledger of digital events, one that can be distributed. It's shared between different parties that are involved in the transaction. Uh, they have something known as a smart contract, right? And uh, blockchain is a fantastic example of how business to business retail works. Uh, think of a scenario where you have an assembly line of, let's say you're trying to create cars, right? So you will have one company which starts by churning out the raw materials. The raw materials, multiple companies that are involved, all of those go to one company which assembles all of them together. The third company, let's say, who paints it. The fourth person who's actually into distribution and sales. 
So you need to have a trust that's established between all these parties out here. And word of mouth is not sufficient. And this can be coupled really well with IoT. It will essentially enable a fantastic and solid security solution. So imagine if you have a sensor that's actually physically moving locations from plant A to B to C to D. And that sensor can actually track the longitude, latitude and longitude, which will give a sense of trust to everybody who's involved, letting them know that, yes, the object has moved from plant A and it has gone to plant B. So uh, it's a good way to essentially maintain a data contract. And that's how IoT can be used with blockchain. Third thing that we have is computer vision. So uh, for those of you who are updated with what Amazon's doing, especially in Seattle, they have something known as the Go Store, uh, the Amazon Go. So what they do is they use this principle of computer vision, sensors, deep learning, a lot of cool stuff to recognize when an object has been taken away from the aisle of the store and just gone into the bag of a consumer, right? So what you're doing here is without involving the middleman who does the checkout or uh, clerical work like cashiers, what you're doing out here is basically recognizing with the help of a barcode or scanner that the object has been lifted from the aisle and has gone into the bag. So uh, this is something, again, that ha uses IoT heavily, a lot of sensor technology, coupled with lots of other things. And uh, the fourth thing that you have would be virtual reality. Now, virtual reality for retail is a very niche market, but it's still out and about. So uh, fashion is one good example where people try to put on, let's say, an HTC Vive or a HoloLens or an Oculus Rift. You're trying to see what you buy in a certain environment, how it looks, augment it with, uh, let's say, a person who's standing behind and see how it would look before you even entertain the idea of buying it. Uh, it's not only limited to retail. It can also be used when it comes to, let's say, purchasing parts for machinery, right? You want to see how that part is going to fit as a whole. After you see that we use virtual reality, then you entertain the idea of buying it. Uh, a few other things that you do have are things like the dash button. You have a button that essentially you just press, it records that press, and let's say you press that when you're falling short of laundry liquid at home. It'll automatically add all of that onto your shopping cart, or uh, let's say you're missing bananas. <laughs> things that you buy frequently, but you definitely do need to remember to do it instead of going to the store, coming back, and then realizing that you've forgotten. So uh, these are multiple technologies that can be used. So we've almost reached the end of the talk. And uh, why now? Why now is essentially a question you ask in terms of why is today a good time to invest in IoT, in cloud, in blockchain, beacons, virtual reality, and uh, 3D, right? So our uh, computer vision. So you want to leverage all the advantages that a cloud platform and all of these technologies are offering in terms of competitive pricing and solutions. Uh, it's a really good day to create a combination of all of these technologies for a revenue model that works for your business. There's ample room for customization. And technology retailers themselves, uh, by that I mean those people who sell cloud platforms. Right? You have multiple people who pretty much do the same thing, but what is it that makes them stand out from everybody else? Which goes back to answer the same question we spoke about before. Your product is great, but what are the non-product offerings you have that is, are you able to deliver things on time, pricing and scaling? So it's coming full circle of sorts when you see the technology retailers themselves have adopted this modern thinking uh, into helping you solve a problem where you're trying to sell something. Uh, so uh, the whole thing, it's, I would like to conclude by saying that IoT is a really good solution that we're using right now. And uh, that is pretty much it. Uh, thanks for listening to my spiel on this. Um, until next time, keep creating. So um, does anybody have any questions on this now? What is the absolute base minimum individual subscription Azure IoT that I need for IoT pretty basic experiment? Okay, uh, why don't you watch me create it right now? I'll create one. So we'll go to the Azure. Oh, I did not switch my screen. My bad. If you can see the screen, I'm on the Azure IoT page. So I'll go to Internet of Things, IoT Hub. Then uh, let me call my hub uh, Measure Weight. So you have a pricing solution that is standard 
So, okay, so this is the pricing solution that you have. As far as I have explored, every cloud offering that's available on Azure has this one option that talks about pricing and scaling policies. So if you click on them, you do have a free one, a free tier, which comes with your subscription, about 8,000 messages per unit per day. Based on the number of messages that are sent between a device to cloud and cloud to device, it has only one unit. So uh, I think that's a good one to start developing and tinkering. And uh, you do have standard ones, which have about 4,000 units. Then uh, that was priced at about $50 per IoT unit, but you do have 200 units available. Uh, a very small solution. You scale that further up to like 200 units with 500 at the price cost, facing about 6 million messages per day. You do have another one in standard. So um, this is one way for you to navigate what the price model is like for every cloud solution that's offered. So does that answer your question, IoT Lab? Thanks, Grace. Uh, thanks for your time. And uh, if y'all have any other questions, then I will post more links in the chat below. And uh, that is my Twitter data. If y'all want to follow me on Twitter, or hear me rambling more about this, all of my rants. So uh, until next time, keep tinkering. Thank you.